Good morning. It is I, the great unpowerful Oz. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? Uh, it's in case you missed psychology. Uh, today is... It's Monday, November 23rd. I knew it was Monday. The November 23rd part was where I got lost. So anyway, um, congratulations. You have made it to Thanksgiving week. Uh, whatever that means for you and those around you, uh, I hope that the short two-day week goes by quickly for us. Um, anyway, if you're watching this, that means you missed class today for whatever reason. I hope you're well, and I hope those around you are well. And um, basically, we're going to keep it pretty simple this week. Uh, we've got just a couple of slides to cover. Uh, we'll do one today. We'll do one tomorrow. And um, I have no new assignment for you this week. So we do have a quiz today. Uh, so if you're um, if you're you're watching this, when you get done with this, look in the classwork tab for the quiz on the parts of an experiment, and uh, do the best you can to get that submitted as soon as you can. Uh, reminders, uh, if you didn't get the Chapter 2 crash course in yet, um, I need that ASAP. Uh, I've been kind of delaying on sending out the parent email. I thought maybe I would wait until after the long weekend, uh, see if maybe some of you guys can get some things in. Uh, basically, the plan, like I said, we're going to do one slide today, one slide tomorrow. And then when we come back from uh, fall break here, we're going to do uh, two slides on the Monday, December 30th. December 1st, we're going to take the test on this unit. Um, so, you know, kind of make sure you're getting your stuff in order. If you're watching these videos, you, know, you can go back and get everything you need. Um, today, basically, the plan is that we're going to cover the two major kinds of experiments that are usually done. Well, it's it's one way to do the experiments that are done. And then we've got that quiz on experimental design, like I said. Um, if you're having any problems with anything, uh, not understanding the experimental design stuff, please reach out. I don't get... <sighs> I have a lot less people ask me for help like this. I, I, I hope maybe that's just because you're getting it and um, you don't have any problems. But if you're having some issues, please, uh, we can schedule a time where we could do like a video chat one on one or, you know, maybe I could, you know, just explain it via email. I, I don't know. Um, but if you're struggling, let me know. Please ask for help. That's what I'm here for. OK. Um, anyway, you know, here we go. We're just going to do that, that one slide. Mouse pointer. Okay, there we go. Whoa, that was weird. All right, there's where we want to be. So uh, we're going to look at two major ways that you can can set up an experiment. And again, there's a lot of ways. I'm just looking at this this division style, and it's looking at a single blind experiment and a double blind experiment. Now, obviously. In a lot of experiments, you have a control group, an experimental group, or or multiple control groups and experimental groups, and so. Um, you know, obviously, you have that independent variable that's being given to somebody, whether it be a medicine or a certain food or they're doing a certain kind of exercise, whatever it is that's being tested. Um, you obviously got to keep track of that somehow. So in a single blind experiment, the experimenter knows whether the subjects are in the experimental group or control group. And so when he hands out, you know, this bottle of water to uh, subject one, he knows that if he's put an extra scoop of potassium in it, for instance, he, he hands that to subject A and goes, okay, and he marks it down on a sheet. And when he hands subject B, the one that's just a bottle of water, a placebo, he knows that. Um, now, obviously, there's a strength to that system. It, it makes it a lot easier to keep track of the data. You know subject A has the experimental potassium in the drink, and so if you start to see some kind of weird side effect, you know right away that it may very well be the independent variable. You know right away that you know you get to be tracking that a little bit closer. You know that if something happens to subject B that it has nothing to do with what you're doing, and, and therefore there, there's other ways you can help. Um, and so it makes the data a lot easier to track. It makes the side effects a lot easier to track. I, I guess overall, it would just obviously make things a lot easier. The issue is, and this, and this is where you run into problems, because when you're running a scientific experiment, you want to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the item works as your hypothesis or hopefully eventually your theory states. And because of that, you have to eliminate bias. And if I give the experimental thing, potassium in this case, to subject A, 
<clears throat> I can use misleading language with that person to convince them that they're feeling better, feeling a certain way. Hey, man, you look really great. Boy, you must be feeling a lot better, not having any leg cramps, blah, blah, blah. Subject B, who has the control, I can go, Ooh, you don't look any better. You don't look good at all to try to justify my thing. So I have experimenter bias that I'm fighting against in a single blind experiment. And so in order to be more scientific, to, to eliminate some of the, the variable of bias, people came up with the double blind study where neither the experimenter nor the subjects know who's in the experimental group or the control group. Now, now listen, some of you guys are sitting there going, hey, hey, I get it. Some of you guys are going, wait a minute. If he doesn't know and they don't know, how does he keep track of anything? Well, first of all, there's a couple of, a couple of ways it can be done. A lot of times it's done through a third party. So let's say that this bottle has a number on it somewhere. This, this bottle came to me sealed. There was a number on the bottom someplace. I don't know, 11356. Bottle 11356. So I go, I write down subject A, 11356, and I hand them the bottle. And they drink it. And I don't know if it has a potassium in it or not. Next person gets 11357. I don't know if it's good or not. 11358, 11359, 1140, you know, and so on and so forth. These different people. And I write down, you know, we keep track. We have them fill out the little form or I fill out the thing or I take their vitals or we measure how many leg cramps they're getting or whatever. And then when everything's said and done, I send that back to a third party who knows what was in each bottle and they track the data more. I'm just really kind of observing and running the study. Obviously, that eliminates experimental bias. The other way things can be done is um, you could, you know, I, I could, you know, obviously have been involved in the process, but I don't know which number goes to which one. They're writing down the number of the thing. And so it eliminates experimental bias, but at the same time, it usually involves a third party, which makes the, sub, makes the, expense, the test a little bit more expensive. Usually vendors of, you know, drugs and things like that are, are fine paying that extra cost to make their study more legitimate. Okay. So that was really all we covered today. Um, please go into classroom and uh, track down the parts of an experiment quiz in the, in the classwork tab and get that done. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I will see you again tomorrow. If you have any questions, reach out. Seriously, I'm not getting enough people asking me for help. Bye-bye.